with us. I know that especially uh, while those numbers are impressive, we're grateful for your attendance here tonight and for your willingness to come together and to listen to the word of God. And tonight he's going to conclude our meeting by teaching us on the topic of, Is Your Home Headed for Heaven? Brother Rollo. How do you get a preacher who typically preaches long to preach shorter? Well, you could tell that preacher to speed up. That wouldn't be a good decision with me. You could uh, tell the preacher that, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, you need to stop early so people can get home on time. Well, that might work on me because I have an 11 and a half hour trip home uh, tonight and tomorrow. Um, but maybe I'll just preach and we'll see how it goes and we'll get you home before too late. The last sermon of this gospel meeting series, a sermon series on the home. The home as God would have it. And we started out the first lesson dealing with the fact that, that God's home is something that people need to understand. It's designed to save souls. And it has been organized by God in a perfect way in our worship hour. We talked about how Satan was the enemy of the home and then the home being an, under an all-out attack. Last night we spoke about the home and the idea of getting uh, our home prepared for death. Well, tonight I have a question and that question is the title of the lesson, Is Your Home Headed Home? In other words, is your home headed to heaven? Turn, if you will, in your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 18, and begin reading with me in verse 25. Ezekiel 18 and 25. Yet ye say, the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? When a righteous man turneth, verse 26, from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, and dieth in them for his iniquity that he hath done, shall he die? Again, when the wicked man turneth from his wickedness, that he hath committed and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. If you go on down to verse number 31. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? And then notice what God says through the prophet. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth saith the Lord God, wherefore turn yourselves and live ye. If you go back to verse 20 of this same chapter, that famous verse, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Here is the point. God wants all men, men and women, to be saved. He's done everything he could do to bring salvation to them. And thus it is up to each of us to make a decision. And we're going to talk about that momentarily. In Psalm 25 and verse 8, we have this verse, Psalm 25 and verse 8. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore will he teach sinners in the way. And he's done exactly that. In your New Testaments, I want you to turn, if you will, to 2 Timothy. I want to show you several passages in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 8. 2 Timothy chapter 1, we're going to look at several verses here in the letter, letters to Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, Paul writing to Timothy, his prisoner. He's of course in Roman prison for the second time. He would be executed this time. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God. Verse 9, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which is given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. We talked about this. The purpose in Christ through the promise of Abraham, Christ came. Notice verse 10. Here's how you're offered this. But it is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light. How, Paul? How did he bring it to light? Through the gospel. Through 
the gospel. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy, just go back just a few chapters in the next book. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and look at verse 8. But bodily exercise profiteth little. Now, it does profit some. Think about people who work out. There's nothing wrong with that. You should take care of your body. But it profits just a little. But notice what profits a lot. But godliness is profitable unto all things, having a promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Well, what is it? Verse 10. For therefore, he goes on, he just made the statement. Then he says, but therefore, we both labor and suffer reproach. Here it is. Because we trust in the living God, not God, the living God. What do we do? We trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, point one, especially of those that believe, point two. There it is. The gospel has been offered to all. But only those that obey the gospel, believe what the gospel is and obey it, will be saved. He's the Savior of all men in opportunity. But He's the Savior in reality of those that believe and meaning, of course, obey His will. Jesus would say in Matthew 11, 28 and following, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Notice, learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. How many people don't really learn about Jesus Christ? Sadly, most don't learn. Not that they couldn't, they don't want to. Tonight, I ask the question, is your home headed for home, for heaven? I want to discuss this in three brief points. Number one, heaven delivered. Number two, heaven described. And number three, heaven decided. Heaven delivered described and decided. Let's begin. Turn to 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 24 in your Bibles. I'll just simply reference it in case you don't get there in time. But 1 Corinthians 15, 24 says, At the end of time, God is going to deliver up the kingdom to the Father. Well, what's the kingdom, Jason? Mark 9, 1 says the kingdom is the church. Mark 9, 1, Some of you that stand here, Jesus said, shall not taste of death until you've seen the kingdom come with power. Acts 1, 8. Luke 24, that power is going to happen in Acts chapter 2. So the kingdom is the church. And there's some, of course, in Jesus' day that saw the church established as Isaiah 2, Daniel 2, Joel 2 had prophesied. It would happen. Acts 2 describes it. The kingdom is the church of Christ. And of course, it is this kingdom that was delivered to the Son as He ascended up into heaven. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. This kingdom, the church, Colossians 1, 13. Paul would say to the Colossians, you've been translated out of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. So we need to realize this, the kingdom, the church, is going to be delivered to the Father so that people who are in the church can spend an eternity in heaven. Do you believe that tonight? There are only two places you can go when you die. Now, I know you go to paradise or torment, but I mean after the judgment. Those in paradise will go to heaven. Those in torment will go to Gehenna hell. If you're alive when the Lord comes back, you're going either straight to heaven or straight to hell. There's only two places. There's no in-between state. There's no purgatory. There's no, well, you know, you just get annihilated or whatever. There is heaven and hell on the line. And a lot of times people act like, uh, well, I don't know if I really believe that. You better study. I'm going to show you some things tonight to show you it's true, but also particularly that you can go to heaven if you decide to go to heaven. And I think you wouldn't be here if you weren't wanting to go to heaven. Jesus is the way to heaven. You know how many times he says, I am? Just take the book of John. He says in John chapter 10 or John chapter 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life, John 6, 35, 6, 45, 6, 51. He says, I am the light of the world, John 8, 12, John 9, 5. Jesus, what else would you say? He says, I'm the door of the sheep, John 10, 7. I am the good shepherd, John 10, 11, 14, and 16. I am the door of the sheep. I think I covered that one. I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. I am the true vine, John 15, 1 and 4. My favorite is in John 11, verse 25, 26. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. I'm the resurrection and the life. Have you ever stood at a... um, 
graveside? I know you have. Maybe of a relative, maybe of a friend. Have you ever thought about your own graveside service? What, what you want said at your sermon uh, uh, that would be spoken? You ever thought about that? I've actually thought about preaching my own funeral. Someone says, Jason, now how are you going to go about that? I'm going to have them play something up on the recording maybe. I've actually already preached it. It's online. You can go to tollstar.org and listen to it. It's called Why I'm a Member of the Church of Christ. And like normal, I preached long, and I don't think they would sit there that long, but, but uh, they'll at least maybe play some snippets from it. You could preach your own funeral, but I will tell you what you will preach. You'll preach your own life. Your life will be brought into the weight, into the balances of judgment, 2 Corinthians 5, 10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. To receive for the things done in the body according to that which we've done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. And I'm glad I'm a Christian because I've done plenty bad, but I know this much, it's all gone. It's been forgiven. So on the day of the ju judgment, if, the sa if Satan is there, and we're of course using some figurative language here, and he's sitting there and he says, well, Jason can't go to heaven. I know he did this and this and this. And Christ, of course, being my advocate, would say, I don't know what you're talking about. Hebrews, quoting from Jeremiah, his sins, I remember no more. Because he's a faithful child of God. And when he, repent, when he, when he uh, sinned, he repented of those sins. 1 John 1, 5 and following. Yes, heaven is a place that's been delivered in the sense that it's been given to us by Christ to go to. He said these things. I, I'm the bread, the light, the, the resurrection, the life, the way, the true vine, etc. Why did he say that? He said that because he came to save people. Friends, I want you to get something tonight. Jesus Christ did not die so no one could go to heaven. Jesus Christ died so that those who obey the gospel and are added to the church would go to heaven. In fact, Acts 20 verse 28 says he shed his blood to purchase the church. 1 Corinthians 15 24 again, at the end of time, he's going to deliver the kingdom to the Father. I'm in that kingdom. If you're a member of the church of Christ, I know many of you are, maybe not all, you are in the kingdom if you're a member of the church of Christ. And if you're faithful, guess what? You'll be delivered to the Father. Jesus has given us the way to go to heaven. Look at Acts chapter 3. I don't want you to miss this. Go to the book of Acts. I'm going to spend a little bit of time in Acts tonight. I've preached a lot of sermons in my life on heaven and done it different ways. But tonight, I, I just wanted to go and spend a little time in the book of Acts. Because I think it brings some things out that will encourage us to either remain faithful or obey the gospel if you haven't. Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse number 13, I taught Acts recently in the school, not this last quarter, but the quarter before, and as I studied and poured over the book of Acts, it kept just coming up over and over how much this book is about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and also how because of that people could obey the gospel and be added to the church, be baptized for the remission of their sins to be added to the kingdom. Notice Acts 3.13. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Remember Genesis 12, the promise made to Abraham. In you shall all nations of the earth be blessed. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are all witnesses. That's what the book of Acts is about. There, the, we have eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now friends, a court of law, if it is what it ought to be, is based on credible testimony. And when you study the book of Acts, there, these men had no reason to lie. They had every reason to give credible testimony for something they had seen. How do I know they gave credible testimony? Because why would they have died martyrs' deaths for things they knew that, that was a lie? Why would they die for something they knew that was false? Now, friends, I can tell you something. A person can believe something and die and be persecuted. But no one is going to die or be persecuted and die for something they know that's a lie. These men knew Jesus Christ came forth from the grave. You know, I think back about the time I went to Jerusalem there 
to the, to the, to the sites where, where there's two disputed sites on the burial tomb, and I went into both places, and I can tell you they're both empty. Jesus Christ is not there. Do you know the one thing Christianity has that no other religion has at all? Just on the surface, Christianity surpasses all of them. They don't have a Savior. What does Islam have? They have a prophet who raided and murdered and pillaged. What, is, what does Buddhism and Hinduism have? They have some fat guy sitting under a tree meditating, trying to mesh with who knows what in the universe. We have a risen Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on a cross. It is one of the most proven facts of all of history. And you are, you are commended and challenged to deal with it. You cannot deny that He died on the cross. Even if you're an atheist, if you're honest, you're going to admit there was a man named Jesus of Nazareth who died on a cross in the first century. It's prophesied about in Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 and many other places. In fact, Psalm 22 prophesies how he would die, crucifixion, which hadn't even been invented yet in 1000 um, B.C. Go a little bit further in the book of Acts. Go to Acts 17 and look at verse 18. Acts 17, 18. I love Acts 17, 18, especially the very last part of the verse. We'll just go there for sake of time. Notice the last sentence starting at because or part of the sentence in verse 18. Acts 17, 18. Don't miss this. It says, because he preached unto them. What is Paul preaching? This is at Mars Hill. Because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. He preached Jesus and the resurrection. Go back to Acts chapter 4. We're going to stay in Acts for just a little bit. Acts chapter 4 and read with me verse number 4. Acts 4 and verse 4. Actually, I'm going to read verse 2 and then verse 4. Verse 2. Acts 4, 2. Being grieved. Why were they grieved? That they taught the people and preached. Well, what were they teaching and preaching to the people? Through Jesus, what were they teaching? The resurrection from the dead. Because he came forth from the grave, you can come forth from the grave. He goes on in verse number 4. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed. And the number of the men was about 5,000. Look at chapter 5 and verse number 14. 5 and 14. And believers were the more added to the Lord. Multitudes, both of men and women. If you go back to Acts 2 verse 41, we'll find there were 3,000 that were baptized there on the day of Pentecost. Someone says, Jason, how could they baptize 3,000 people? They would have to have a lot of baptistries. Have you ever studied Jerusalem history from the standpoint of archaeology and all of the mikvahs and the Old Testament Jewish quote-unquote baptistries that were there? They have discovered them by the just plethora, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them that would have been in existence in the city of Jerusalem. There were baptistries everywhere. 3,000, 5,000, multitudes, men and women. Why were they being baptized? Why were people being converted to the church, to, the, to Jesus Christ, being added to the church of Christ by the thousands and thousands and thousands in the first century? I'll tell you why, because there was an empty tomb. There was an empty tomb. In fact, there was so much power in the resurrection of Christ. Look at Acts 6, 7 in your Bible. This is referring to the Jewish priests, many of the Jewish leadership, Acts 6 and 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Sadly, if you go over to the 13th chapter of Acts, as a whole, the nation of Israel had rejected God, although not all, as we just saw. Take the Apostle Paul. You want to believe in Jesus? Go study the life of the Apostle Paul. Here's a man who had everything. He gave it all up to be persecuted. Why? He said, I count my life as but dung that I may win Christ. Why, Paul? <laughs> he saw the resurrected Lord. Acts chapter 13, verse number 45. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. You want to know why today denominational people don't leave all of the shackles of denominationalism and just become New Testament Christians? Money, power, family, prestige, hard-headedness, the past. I don't know what the problem is. It's the same thing the Jews struggled with. 
For when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should have first been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves, how serious is that, unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Now go back to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. When you're reading through Acts, these things should just be jumping off the pages at you. Acts chapter 8. What does verse 5 say? Acts 8 and 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria. What did he preach? He preached Christ unto them. What does verse 12 and 13 say? Now when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom, there's the church of Christ, of God, and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, it's immersed in water, both men and women, no children, no no sprinkling, no baby baptism. Men and women, why? Because you have to believe and know what you're doing. It involves belief, repentance, confession, in order to be baptized into Christ. Keep going down. Acts chapter 8. You get down to verse number 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture. What did he do? He preached Jesus. And of course, this eunuch was baptized in water. And we know it was for the remission of sins because that's what Acts 22, 16 and Acts 2, 38 teaches. Now, with some of that in mind, go to Romans chapter 1 and then I'll go to my second point. Romans chapter 1. Oh, the book of Romans is quite a book. What a book. People understand, oh, they misunderstand Romans. It's so sad. Our Baptist friends, they, 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 they go on the Roman, they talk about the Roman road, and they'll do some of it correct, and then they miss the point. And, and, and it's sad because the, they get some of it correct, and then they miss some of it, and it's, it's, it's sad. Romans 1.1, 1, 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God which he had promised afore by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. What is the Old Testament pointing to? Jesus, look at verse 3. Concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. You know, if you get back into the Old Testament history, you're going to find one of the kings that was a little baby. The rest of the seed line had been destroyed. And one little six-month-old baby and his own grandmother, I believe it was, tried to kill him and he survived. Why did that little baby survive? So that Jesus Christ could come into the world and he would be the one to offer salvation to all men, all women, all people, everywhere if they would obey the gospel and become New Testament Christians. And then, of course, you look at verse 5. By whom, I'm sorry, don't let me miss verse 4. And declared to be the Son of God. The idea of declared here is a settled verdict. It's like the verdict is in and it's settled. Well, what, what, what's the verdict? That he, according to the power of God, by the spirit of holiness, that's referring to his deity, that he resurrected from the dead, by the resurrection of the dead. What, what does that mean, verse 5? By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations. So heaven has been, heaven has been delivered. That is, Jesus came and, and did his part. He died on the cross. What does Luke 19, 10 say? It says, Jesus said, I came to seek and save that which was lost. John 10, 10. I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. John 3, 16. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Romans 5, verse 8 and following. God commended his love toward us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Heaven has been delivered in the sense that salvation has been offered to all people. Why are there so many religious groups today? Because they've twisted the word of God. There was an apostasy in the first century. Read Acts chapter 20. It talks about even among the eldership there would be some grievous wolves who would enter in not sparing the flock. He gave the solution. Acts 20, 32. I commend you to God to the word of his grace which is able to build you up, give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. The solution is the Word of God. The problem is some people don't want to stick with the Word of God. And so you had all of the corruption that eventually became Catholicism. And then for hundreds of years you had the Dark Ages and then the Reformation movement. People were trying to reform. The problem is they were trying to reform that which was corrupt instead of going back and restoring pure New Testament Christianity. You know the difference in reformation and restoration? Think about a man, if he has a truck and he uh, has a rocking chair, wooden rocking chair in the back of that truck. He's driving down the road and uh, then that, um, that 
chair flies out of the truck and breaks into, you know, 20 pieces. Someone comes along and they take and they reform that wood into a coffee table. Now that's reformation. But what if someone were to take and restore it to the original rocking chair? Well, that's restoration. And so when we talk about the restoration movement, we're not talking about something that's still ongoing. We're talking about when men simply went back to the Bible and became pure New Testament Christians, just like you see in Acts chapter 2. People will say, well, where do you, where do you go to church? Or, or what kind of Christian are you? As if there's more than one kind. I said, I, I'll say I'm a New Testament Christian. Well, what do you mean a New Testament Christian? I'm a member of the church that you read about in the New Testament. A member of the church of Christ. A member of the church described in the Bible. Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock I'll build my church. Heaven has been delivered because of what Christ did for us. I wish I had more time in the book of Acts. I'll just quote one of the passages there. When, when one of the leaders, I believe it was Festus, and, 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 and uh, a couple of the people needed to, 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 he invited some of the leaders that came down to hear Paul because he had Paul locked up, didn't know what to do with him. And he tries to give the description of why Paul's in prison. And here's what he pretty much said. He said, let me give you the summary. He said, here's the problem. He said, I thought it was something else, but really it's dealing with, you know, something between the Jews and him because they say that this man Jesus is dead, but Paul says he's alive. That's what the book of Acts is about. Jesus is alive. He came forth from the tomb. And friends, if Jesus Christ is real, and if Jesus Christ is alive, and if Jesus shed his blood for the church, and if Jesus is going to take the kingdom of the Father, I promise you, you better be in that kingdom. You, you, you need to be in the church of Christ if you want to make it to glory. Unless you're a little child and you're innocent, and that's okay because you're in a safe, S-A-F-E position because you're not yet L-O-S-T lost. Therefore, you don't need to be S-A-V-E-D saved. But if you're lost, if you're an age of accountability and you understand what I'm saying, you need to make a decision to obey the gospel tonight to get into, to be added to, you can't join, to be added to the church of Christ. The church of the New Testament, one that can be described in the pages of the Bible, how they worship, what they believe, how they're to act. Someone says, Jason, I've seen some of the people in the churches of Christ and they don't always act like what the Bible says. God will deal with that, but that doesn't mean it's not perfectly described in this book. He'll take care of hypocrites the same way he will those who rebel against his word. Well, what about heaven described? Someone says, Jason, how are you going to preach a sermon and describe heaven? This could take all night. It could except for I'm not going to hurt you too bad tonight. I want you to notice how quick I'm about to describe heaven. This, each one of these points could be a whole sermon. Case center somewhere. He could preach a whole series on this. So take notes. Heaven is described as a city. Hebrews 11.10. Hebrews 11.10. I do want you to look over to Hebrews. I'm not going to look up all of these passages, but I want to show you a few of them. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 10 says this. Hebrews 11, really verse 10. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now I went there because if you go to verse 13, notice it's also described, we're going to see in verse 14 to 16 as a country. But we'll start in verse 13, Hebrews eleven thirteen. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. Think about Abraham looking, if you will, figuratively speaking, into the future toward the church. And were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Don't miss that either. For they say, they say such things, declare plainly that they seek a country. So heaven is described as a city, Hebrews 11, 10. It's described as a country, verse number 14. But if you get down to number 16, verse 16, it tells you what kind of city and what kind of country. And now they desire a better country. That is an heavenly Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. We're talking about a heavenly city, a heavenly country, if you will. Well, how else is, is heaven described? Well, it's described in various ways. Notice that it's described in Isaiah 6, 1 as a temple. That passage in Isaiah 6, 1, which, by the way, is quoted in John 12 and applied to Jesus, describes Jehovah with his, his train of filling the temple, if you will, the temple. Also, heaven is described as glory, 1 Timothy 3.16, where it refers to Jesus and how he was caught up to glory. Heaven is glory. It also is the paradise of God, Revelation 2 and verse number 7. 
Go to John 14. John 14. You're going to see in John 14 that it's referred to in several ways. Heaven in John 14 is described and referred to as a house or mansions, if you will, or rooms or a place of rest or a place of stopping and abode. It's described also as a house. Look at John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, many rooms, many dwelling places, if you will. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you uh, unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I love verse 4, and whither I go, you know, and the way you know. You know, we have some people that think that somehow heaven's going to be on earth. That's not true. This would make Jesus a liar. He didn't say where you are there, I will come and abide. He said where I am there, you may come. You can't reverse his words. Not to mention, why would he call it a heavenly city and a heavenly country if it's going to be an earthly city and an earthly country? That makes no sense. Heaven is referred to as the throne room of God, Matthew 5, 34. It says heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. Yeah, there's a difference in heaven and earth. Earth's going to be burned up, but heaven's not going to be burned up. Not the ultimate heaven. The first two heavens will be where the birds fly and the stars exist, but not where God dwells. Isaiah 57, 15, God inhabits eternity. Jesus made this so plain. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, Matthew 6. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Jesus understood heaven was another place, because in John 17, verse 5, he prays to the Father, and he says, Father, restore me to the glory I had with you before the world was. You read Daniel 7, he's caught up to heaven, to the throne room of God, and he's at the right hand of God, on, on the throne, at the right hand of God, if you will. Heaven is described as a kingdom, 2 Timothy 4, 18. Someone says, Jason, you said the church was a kingdom. It is. But also heaven is described as a kingdom as well. 2 Timothy 4, in verse number 18, notice this language. Paul says, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. Now that reminds me of Philippians 3.20. It says that our citizenship is in heaven. Well, no wonder then that he said we're strangers and pilgrims in this world. 1 Peter 2.11. He said, I beseech you, brethren, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. Why? 1 John 2. For the things of this world are going to be, it's going to be gone. It's going to be burned up. They're going to pass away. And the lust thereof. Yes, heaven's a serious thing. It's described as a kingdom. 2 Timothy 4.18. Also in Matthew 25, this kingdom concept is given. Heaven is described as a bride, Revelation 21. Someone says, oh, that's the church. Okay, fine. That's the church glorified. That's what's being described there. It is the church, but it's the church in its glorified state, I believe. And I've, I've done a thorough study of the book of Revelation multiple times. What about rest? Heaven is described as a rest. Matthew 11, come unto me, take my yoke upon you, learn of me. You're meek and lowly in heart. I shall give you rest. Unto your souls, that's in heaven, John 14. What about uh, Hebrews 4? The, Hebrews 4, 3 and 4, the whole thing is, uh, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. Heaven is rest. It's also referred to as joy. Matthew 25, 21 and following. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. I love 1 John 1, 4. 1 John 1, 4. Look this one up. This will be worth your time. 1 John 1 and verse number 4. I want you to see it with your own eyes. 1 John 1, 4. Listen to this language. And these things, W-R-I-T-E, write. Jason, what's your point? Keep going. And these things write we unto you. John, why are you writing these things to the brethren? And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. In other words, I can have joy based on the things that I read and understand. And I go back to, again, Matthew 25. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. What's going to be in heaven? Joy. Rest. A mansion. A home. We're, we're the bride. The church is the bride of Christ, glorified in the kingdom as a kingdom, be, as being a kingdom itself. The paradise of God. The temple. 
Again, the city, the country. It's also described as being with Christ. Remember Philippians 1.23? I desire to depart and be with Christ. Also with God. Revelation 21 talks about God. We, we shall be with God. 1 John 3 says when the end of time comes, we're going to see Him, Jesus, as He is. 1 John 3, 1 and following. Salvation. Philippians 1.28 1 Thessalonians 5.8 is called salvation. Heaven, heaven's called salvation. What about this? It's a reaping. Galatians 6 says you're going to reap what you sow. Well, guess what? We're going to reap heaven. We're going to reap glory. It's even referred to in a figurative sense as, as a barn in Matthew 13. The barn where all the wheat is kept. Not a literal barn. These are figurative descriptions. How about this one? Victory. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 and following, it says we shall have victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 5, 4, faith is the victory. I love Revelation 15, 2. Revelation 15, 2 describes the, the church, the people of God there, and there's no more sea. They have this sea, the seas mingled with fire. That's the persecution they've been through, but then they're, they're with God. There's no more separation. There's victory that is described as the glorification of God's people in heaven. And you know what heaven is described as? It's described as heaven. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. You would think you wouldn't have to show this to people. But when some of our brethren, especially in Texas, came out with some of this nonsense about heaven being on earth, which is Jehovah's Witnesses' false doctrine, and I, I don't know how many degrees you have to have to misunderstand this, but I can tell you one thing, you don't have to be very smart to read what it says. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. He didn't say hope. He said a lively hope. I don't have time to do this. So I'm just going to tell you. You can look it up later. Proverbs 10, Proverbs 13, Job, I think it's chapter 31. How do you describe hope? What's the definition of hope? If we've been got, gotten into a lively hope, I, I would want to know what hope is. Well, if you go read those passages I just gave you, you're going to find this. Words are used interchangeably in some of those passages. So it'll say like the word, you know, a desire, and then it'll have the word hope, meaning hope and desire could be used interchangeably. Here's the point. When you look it up in the Old Testament, hope involves desire, expectation, and confidence. Now, read it this way. He says, he's begotten us again into a lively desire, a lively expectation, a lively confidence. He calls it hope. Begotten us again into a lively hope. Brethren, I was going somewhere in the book of Acts. What brings it about? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I know that Jesus Christ came forth from the grave. Therefore, I have desire. I have expectation. I have confidence. I have hope. And Romans 8, 24 says, saved by Hope. And Ephesians chapter 4 said there's one hope. One hope. And the next verse, verse 4, says that hope is in heaven through Jesus, Titus 2, 11 and following, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. So some little old smart aleck gets over there studying N.T. Wright and a. Randy Alcorn and all these other false teachers that try to make heaven into something on earth. And they get over there in 2 Peter and they say, well, he talks about a new heaven and a new earth. Well, that language is from Isaiah. And it's referring to a new environment. And the new environment is heaven itself. Because the same person who wrote 2 Peter 3 wrote 1 Peter 1. And he says it's reserved in heaven. Which is exactly what Paul said in Colossians 1, 5 and 6 and 7. So I have no idea how anyone could ever read their New Testaments and teach some of this nonsense. But we have churches of Christ with men who, who teach this thing. And, and, and even say things like, well, I mean, is it a big deal after all? I mean, can it just be an opinion? You start messing with my hope, it's not an opinion. There's one hope. Our hope is in heaven. Our hope is through Jesus Christ to go to heaven. And when you say it's an opinion, no, it's not. It's not an opinion. This is a hope. This is, this is the hope of Romans 8, verse number 24. Oh, they love Romans 8, but they don't understand Romans 8. Romans 8 could be personification, but if you actually go and read those passages, I believe the creation there is the church, Christians, and the first fruits, I believe, are the apostles. 
And so the point is, he's, he's, I believe, simply saying that the creation, the church, those in the church, just like the world that suffers as well, but Christians, they moan and they long for something. What is it? To be clothed on with immortality, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. They have this hope. And then if you read the rest of Romans 8, the last part, we're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Heaven. Described as a temple, as glory, the paradise of God, a house, a place, a throne, a kingdom, a bride, rest, life, joy, salvation, a reaping, victory, heaven, hope. And you know my favorite? You know my favorite because I've been gone a long time from my house. My favorite may be home. Home. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he's describing the body. And he says there that, that, that uh, well, just look there. I don't want to try to, you know, do damage to the text. Look at 2 Corinthians. I read this last night. But I want you to go there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and look at verse number 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, that's our body, we have a, we're dissolved, again, loosed down, the body loosed down, Philippians 1, the spirit loosed up. We have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And then in verse 8, we are confident, I say, willing to be absent from the body and to be present, or I believe the ASV says, to be at home with the Lord. My brother is a gospel preacher. When he's a little boy, we went and camped in a um, hot East Texas. I don't know what we're thinking in the summertime. It was hot. He's two or three or four at the time. And I mean, we're miserable. We're sweating. And before the night was over, we would go to the house because we just couldn't take it anymore. We're out there in the middle of the pasture, you know. And he would just sit there, and he, he was little, and he would say, I want my home. And he would get louder, I want my home. And he just, he wouldn't quit, I want my home. Brethren, do you want home? Do you want to take your home home? Then you need to be serious about your Christianity. Serious about the way you live, the way you teach other people. Paying attention to your children. If they start not paying attention in Bible class, that's a problem. Ask them what they learn. Study with them at home. Make sure that they're serious about their soul and about their Christianity. Guess what? You can become stronger. You may say, you know what, really? I haven't been that strong. You can become strong starting now. Because I'm telling you, heaven is worth it all. It is our home. It is our hope. Heaven is described in the Bible as this marvelous place. It's not a place of lattes and roller coasters and this mundane materialism of these modern denominational people. It is a glory spiritual place that God is not fully described. In Revelation, all of the language of the gold and pearls, that's figurative, simply saying it's so majestic you can't fully comprehend it. But you can go there. You can go there if you're a faithful member of the church and you don't give up your, your faith. Heaven has been delivered in the sense of the opportunity to go there. Heaven has been described. And finally tonight, and it's really kind of my concluding point too, heaven has to be decided. You have to decide if you want to go to heaven. Go to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. And I want you to remember back to Romans 1 where he's been declared... Um, the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. And then I want you to refer in your mind back to what we read earlier in Acts 3 in verse number 15. And then I want you to compare this to what we see in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 and begin in verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for the sins, for sins, the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. By which also he went and preached. Now, how did he do this? Through Noah, 2 Peter 2, 5, who was a preacher of righteousness. Other places refer to the Spirit of Christ, which was in them. So Noah is preaching through the Holy Spirit, particularly through the teachings of Christ, if you will. When was he doing it? Back long time ago in the days of Noah. He says, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. In other words, the, the spirits of lost men are in torment now, but he preached to them back then. Verse 20, which sometime were disobedient. That's when he was doing the preaching, when Noah was doing the preaching during his, his day. When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by 
water. Verse 21, the like figure whereunto even doth baptism doth also now save us. Parenthetically, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. You want to have a good conscience? Be baptized into Christ. Then you don't have to worry about those sins. They've been washed away by his blood. Notice, don't miss the last phrase. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just like in Acts. Because Jesus Christ came forth from the grave. Jason, or wait a minute, let me, let, me, let me get this. Are you saying, Jason, because Jesus died, was buried, and resurrected, that the salvation has been offered, that I can actually live in such a way as to know when I die, ultimately after judgment, I can go to heaven? That's exactly what I'm saying. His resurrection gives you an assurance of that. And if you are not a child of God, you can be baptized into Christ tonight and have a good, clean conscience. Why? Because God said He'll take your sins away by His Son's blood when you, you do that act of obedience. I, I don't, he just said it because He's God. He wants to know if you love Him and be added to His church. What a beautiful, beautiful section of Scripture. You know, as I read this verse, I think about the Ark Encounter up in uh, Kentucky. I've been there. That is an impressive, impressive place. They did a very good job, from what I can tell, with honest, accurate Bible scholarship laying out that Ark. I mean, it is worth going to. And I, I was just, I mean, amazed going through there. And I plan to go back again. And as I go through there, I'm like, wow, this is so amazing. A lot of what the Bible teaches. And, and no doubt that Noah, I mean, it, I knew it anyway, but this is really good stuff. And then you go through the last room. And the one thing they don't put in there is this verse. That it was water that separated the lost world from those saved in the ark. Because of the people that put it together are denominational. And I thought to myself, are you kidding me? They are like 95, 98, 99% amazing. And the one step that puts a person into Christ, baptism doth also now save us. That's the one thing they're going to leave off. They carried you right up to the ark, figuratively speaking, biblically speaking, and won't let you in the door. It hurts me. There are so many decent, kind people, people I love. That aren't going to be in heaven because be in heaven because at the end of the day, they haven't obeyed Jesus. Jesus said, "Not everyone that says Lord, Lord shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven." And can I pause and say this, brethren? If you are a member of the Lord's church, and you would be if you're a brethren, <laughs> if you're a member of the church, you need to work extra hard to make sure and work by that I mean live right, not earn it, to be what you should be. It scares me to death. To think people could look at me and go, you know what? If he's a member of the church of Christ, I don't think I want any part of that. Because I can tell you right now, the church of Christ is the true church. Jesus died to save the church. And if they look at me and they say, you know what? He's a hypocrite. He, he doesn't live like, like he ought to live. That, that could do damage. But what if they look at me and go, you know what? He's not perfect. They know that because they know they aren't either. But you know what? He's striving to live the best he can. And everything he says comes straight from the Bible. And it's pretty obvious that he's making a decision to follow the Scriptures and only the Scriptures. Then all of a sudden they may be invited to come go with us. That old saying, we, we won't pass this way again. That's true. So my question as we close is, are you dedicated? Matthew 16, 24 says that a man should deny himself and follow him. What shall a man, verse 26, give in exchange for his soul? I tell you, nothing's worth giving. It's not worth giving anything to give up your soul. 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of eternal life. Lay, or fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Paul in 2 Timothy 4, wow, what a statement. Verse 6, he's basically, he's basically saying, I've been poured out like a drink offering. I'm ready, to, I'm ready to, to, to depart. That's talking about his execution by Nero. I believe it was going to be upcoming. And then he goes on and says, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day. Don't you miss this last part. And not to me only but to all them also that love His appearing. When you go through the Bible, you're going to read words like crown of righteousness, crown of glory, crown of life, 
incorruptible crown. Go look them up. Go to the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3. Overcome, overcome, overcome. Guess what? If you overcome, you can come over. Now, you could become a Christian and then give up on God, Revelation 3, 5, and your name could be blotted out of the book of, the, of life. But guess what? If you don't give up, that means your name will not be blotted out of the book of life. In fact, go study that. Philippians 4, Hebrews 12, Luke, uh, also in the book of Luke. And, and going back to the Old Testament and in Revelation, this idea of the book of life, the book of life, the book of life. Is your name written in the book of life? Revelation chapter 20, verse 8 and following, you have basically three things referenced there. You have the book of one's deeds. You have the books of the Bible, which is going to be the standard that Jesus the Christ will use to judge us. And then you have the book of life. Is your name written in the book of life? It's really simple. Are you a member of the Church of Christ? If you are a member of the Church of Christ, are you faithful? Well, I'm a member of the Church of Christ, but I'm, I'm not really faithful. I don't live right. Well, guess what? Your name's been blotted out of the book, and you need to come home and get it right. Get it put back in the book. Well, I, I'm, I'm not a member of the Church of Christ, and your name's not in the book. Well, I'm a member of the Church of Christ, and though I'm not perfect, and though I sin, when I sin, I repent of those sins, 1 John 1, and I'm striving to live right, and I'm not going to give up, and I'm going to follow what the Bible teaches. Guess what? Your name's in the book of life. And heaven will be your home. This temple, this glory, this house, this mansion, this city, this country, this, this, this bride come, we are the bride, but the bride that goes back to the, to the, to the husband. Heaven is worth it all. And my question tonight, again, would be this. Is your home headed home? Only you know. Only you know. I've told you how to become a Christian. You're baptized for the remission of sins. If you came up here tonight and you said, Jason, I want to be immersed in water for the remission of my sins, I would first ask you a question. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And by that I mean born of a virgin, died on the cross, buried in the grave, came forth from the grave. Do you believe all those things? That He is the Messiah of the, of the Bible? And if you said, yes, I believe He's the Savior, the Son of God. Of course, I would then baptize you into Christ based on that confession. Now, I would also realize you had repented or you wouldn't want to, be, you wouldn't want to do that. Well, what's repentance, Jason? Repentance is changing your mind toward the former lifestyle. You know, there are sometimes people think God won't forgive me. Well, I've, you know, I've, I've cussed and I've drank and I've fornicated. Or maybe I've done no, none of those things, but I was disobedient to my parents. I don't care what it was. If you violated Scripture and you're not a child of God, you've been separated from God. In the words of Jesus, come back to me again. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the true vine. I am the light of the world, etc. But the favorite one, I am the resurrection and the life. I'm about to head back to Texas. I have no idea if I'll die on the road or make it home. Truth is, you don't know if you'll make it home either. The one thing I can almost assure you of, this audience tonight will never again be together. Not, there's no way. No way this audience will ever be together with the exact same people. You may be here tonight and maybe you've thought about being baptized, but you just, you just don't know. We'll study more. Or maybe you're ready. I want to tell you this much. If you're not a child of God and, and, and you need to go home and you need to toss and you need to turn, or turn uh, and, and can't sleep, you need to get it right. I hope you don't even do that. I hope you just obey the gospel tonight. But if you're not a child of God or you are an unfaithful child of God, you need to get it fixed. Death is certain. Judgment is certain. But if you are a child of God, living according to the Scriptures as a member of the New Testament church, friends, trust what Jesus said. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. You believe God? I do. If you have a need, won't you come as we stand and we sing?